National Program for Epistemology, Ethics, and Policy Making. And uh, in fact, the, the biggest part of my speech will be about epistemology, about epistemological challenges coming from uh, the standard nationalism. Um, nationalism has been characterized as a low key and epistemologically unproductive topic of research by some researchers. Uh, this is what happened two years ago at the conference in Zagreb, which was a kind of revision of Yugoslav feminism, that one of my respondents uh, said, uh, uh, and she wrote it also, that studying nationalism doesn't reveal researchers' intelligence, doesn't contribute to the scientific community with any innovation, and basically it's not worthy of uh, of an academic to deal with the nationalism. There was a very interesting debate following this one. I, I must say I was deeply intrigued by this. Uh, because in my own words, being the nationalism, uh, especially the Christian nationalism from the mid-80s till today, um, is like putting your head in a garbage can and trying to see what is there. So uh, dealing with nationalism, I agree, is not a pleasant thing to do. But is it really unworthy? Is it really not innovative? In fact, is it really uh, empowering, empowering the, the academia? Is it really lowering down the intellectual level? This is the question that, in a way, I wanted to, to answer not only with this paper, but almost with, with many with many things that I was working on in, in the last uh, two decades. So I will try to argue that this is ethically, politically, and epistemologically questionable hypothesis. So I'll start with, with some uh, general remarks about nationalism as I see it in, in order to be able to, to put forward the argument against this hypothesis. Since its very beginnings, the nationalist discourse has had a tendency to monopolize the space of communication. Wandering between academia and media, philosophy and populism, or common sense, pragmatic and rhetoric, poetry and politics. It still bears signs of the flaws of the scientific thinking of the past century, especially the 19th and the 20th as well as of the most extravagant and avant-garde ideas of the past century, that is the 20th century. That's basically the core of my thesis, that we usually deal with nationalism uh, in the context of traditional or traditionalist ideas and motives. But in fact, and uh, I'm stressing here the case of Balkan nationalisms, we deal quite too often with ideas uh, emerging from avant-garde movements, especially those avant-garde movements, movements which were characteristic for the middle of Europe in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it also bears the nationalism, of course, uh, traces of several opposing ideological projects, some of them clearly defined as nationalist, like national socialism and fascism. Some suspiciously inclined to embrace this nationalism like communism. Even if subject to, to elaborate aesthetic procedures and linked to highbrow literary projects, nationalist discourse has always a message to deliver, message disclosing the truth, universal, collective, undeniable by any individual. This prophetic context places nationalist discourse somewhere between political, poetic, scientific and religious discourse. And in fact, uh, in working on this paper, I was inclined to use two quite opposing sources of text and ideological propositions. One is the movements, the other is theology, classical, early medieval theology. <coughs> and it uses elements of all of them. Nationalist discourse is thus a hybrid genre with a collage-like structure in which each and every element is recognizable and readable in terms of its original context. I have a tendency, tendency to speed up, so <laughs> if I do so, please <laughs> let me know. The overall message, however, emerges clearly from the disposition and the structure of the elements and cannot be mistaken. 
nationalist discourse most often addresses large audiences, or elites which will perceive themselves as representatives of the masses. Therefore, the rhetoric of the nationalist discourse will rely on popular paradigmatic common sense, as opposed to scientific and philosophical reflection, and would not venture into complicated multidimensional criticism. The use of popular myths, which assume the function of biblical parabole, here I need to explain things, um, when you deal with ancient myths, you deal with the uh, innumerable varieties and possible stories which are not competitive at all, which all can be important for a certain group. So there is no hierarchy of versions. Uh, hi the hierarchy in mythological stories is usually given by interpreters much, much later. Uh, but when we come to parabole, and the myth tells a story, which we all know is false, but we enjoy it freely. Uh, and in one of his last takes on mythology, Jean-Pierre Bernard pointed exactly to this difference between religion and myth. And this is that in mythology you can choose and enjoy and use your, your pleasure as the only criteria. <coughs> so that's the interpretive network of one kind, which is uh, a treasure of humanity. And the other is the biblical parabola, which tells you a story which you have to understand, which you can understand only if you replace all the elements with other elements, which you're supposed to know. Otherwise, you don't understand the story. You don't understand the burning bush if you don't know the meaning of the burning bush. Basically, it's a pre-knowledge that defines the story. Uh, so the use of popular myths, which assume the function of, of biblical parabola more than ancient myth, range from those of traditional oral poetry, this is of course the case of the Balkans, to pop culture. Nationalist, na nationalist narrative is not choosing. Moreover, it deliberately blurs any clear distinctions and mixes willfully oranges and apples. The examples from the pre-war Yugoslav nationalist discourses <coughs> and its war hyperproduction open the vast panorama of a genre capable of taking different forms, reviving old and inventing new genre clusters, nationalist memoirs, new mystifications of oral poetry, belligerent homily, fascist essay and manifesto. I take here the example of Futurist uh, Manifesto as, as the, the first text, source text, propagandistic drama, and so on. Orthodox rhetoric, socialist realist propaganda, and decadent pseudo-estheticism mix in these forms freely. Using the responding thesaurus of motives, metaphors, images, allusions, and so on. Nationalist discourse is a resourceful genre, vital and inventive, which is understandable when we have in mind the constant need for repetition of basic truths. This inventive drive depends obviously on the force, capacity, and will to undertake such a deed by the creative and rhetorically and intellectually excelling population, intelligence. Nationalist discourse cannot survive on half-educated narrative makers. It must, must seek the innovative force and intellectual feedback. Intelligentsia, if it goes for the nationalist discourse, endangers its own integrity, its own innovative force and feedback. Nationalist discourse is lethal for intelligentsia in the long run, but that doesn't mean that intelligentsia doesn't do it. The adherence to nationalist discourse in search of power can cause visible changes in academic population, emigration, loss of positions, change in generations, new schools, new institutions, destructions of institutions, and so on. Thus, the instability of the narrative makers in the nationalist discourse uh, socialist context makes it difficult to form a steady level of persuasiveness. It must constantly strive for authors and the originality, which in my view coincides very much with the formation of stereotypes, which are the main uh, weapon of, of uh, this discourse. And stereotypes 
uh, linguistically uh, opposed to what we usually believe, uh, stereotypes are not stable. They change very quickly. They change from, in one generation, they change many, many times. They even change from week to week if we follow the intensive situation, some co intensive contexts. The tension between the need for originality and the need for the set of stable stereotypes enables the nationalist discourse to search by and large in all the ways from national to comics. National discourses have their natural meanings, stylistic procedures, figures of speech, and other textual historical signifiers that can be detected, analyzed, and cataloged in order to be properly contextualized and in such way demythified. My analysis will explore the positioning of national discourses from the Yugoslav region in relation with historical artistic movements of futurism, surrealism, social realism, and modernism. But I will also include something that I think is extremely important, and this is the study of rhetoric, the ancient rhetoric and the continuation post-structuralist uh, interpretation of ancient rhetoric as it proved me uh, from France in the 70s and 80s. So along the great lines of liturgy, this is again an explanation that I have to, have to give. Liturgy is my term, which I introduced some six years ago, and it's now accepted by a group of researchers on mythology all over Europe, some eight universities are included, and we have meetings each year, uh, usually between Trieste and Ljubljana. And the mythology is the term which describes the mechanisms of working with myths, doing things with myths. So it's not mythology or mythopeia, uh, which is a literary term, but it is an anthropological revision of how we do things with the myths, which of course uh, means basically the ancient myths are not dead, they are still usable, we see it all around us. And it also means that uh, mechanisms should be detected and deconstructed in order to understand how the myths are made. Uh, so uh, along these lines, from national narratives, I will also explore something that uh, was missed in most of the studies on nationalist discourses, and this is the mistakes in style and distinctive signs of nationalist, which are distinctive signs of nationalist discourses. This is one of the problems. We do not study anymore ancient rhetoric, so we do not know what the mistakes are anymore. And they are, uh, the problem of stylistic uh, and uh, mistakes in style are very, very low on the list of general education in schools and even um, higher, so in the higher education. So we do have a problem of, of denoting, of understanding, and of detecting the mistakes, the stylistic mistakes. So, um, I would, uh, in this sense, I, I, I think the need to, to position myself to explain how did I come to this. The education of my generation went into a mature phase in the 70s and 80s of the past century through liberation from theoretical models in which the life of the author and the, the environment, his or her environment, formed the interpretive and the narrative framework of critique and literary history. The change occurred by the end of the century through a painful intrusion of life practices into humanities and affected almost everything we consider the European legacy of the age of reason. We have to start to doubt the non-relation between the author and his work in the cultural and social practices. So in the same generation, we had to deconstruct the idea of biography being important for the author and the connection between his life or her life and his or her work. And we had to come back to this and explore it again. Uh, before, um, before in, that is in the 70s and 80s, we used to defend the authors accused of verbal delinquency. This is quite specific of Yugoslavia with the argument about the arbitrary relation of the author and his mostly textual work. Of course, the, the visual work is much, much less affected by, by this regulation. We quoted Umberto Eco and his opera Aperta in the courthouses. The lawyers who were defending the, the, 
perpetrators of verbal, per, verbal delinquency were using the quotations from, from uh, great theoreticians of literature. The judges seemed almost grotesque in their candid efforts to connect the mind and the action in an almost Socratic tradition, unable to respond adequately to the intellectually superior defense. Of course, there was no such thing as a liberating centers to verbal delinquency. All of them were centers. Some of them went earlier out of the jail or didn't go to jail at all. Uh, but all of them were sentenced in former Yugoslavia. Paradoxes like this one were characteristic for the Yugoslav situation. But at least this made us believe to the power of theory and reflection and trained us in writing in an often impenetrable style, using the opacity for one population as the key of understanding for the other, and thus forming the intellectual milieu of the elites. Uh, this is a, a statement that I would like to, to propose as, as a, as a start, start, start of the debate. And this is that uh, invisible censorship or non-existing, uh, declarated non-existent, declared non-existing censorship as in former Yugoslavia, uh, was very um, fruitful for intelligence, that it, it fed intelligence in breaking through the rules, uh, palpitating through the darkness of, of unknown into the possibility of expressing oneself. So, virtuosity in preserving the dignity of humanities sometimes had a shady sign. The fact that we sometimes defended, defended fools, uh, and I'm saying this quite often, and those who were uh, accused of verbal living, some of them not, were all, not only foolish, but also acted as war criminals. But the pleasure we had was undeniable. All of this was possible in the situation of limited, but slowly growing and expanding space of public discourse, which was at its peak several years after Tito's death. The social and cultural result of this was that the group of dissidents became not only visible, but in fact trendy in the cities like Belgrade, Zagreb, and Vidal. The massiveness of the group led to great diversity of proposed political opinions for the future, and on the other hand, to the simplification of discourses, which was just considered more apt for political practices. So, with the growth of political ideas, the diversity grew the, the need for simplicity, uh, which was considered useful for these practices, for the future practices. Soon the prevalent discourse adopted by communist castaways, as their wooden language lost importance, was nationalist discourse, easy to invent, effective, politically useful. Many dissidents, in fact, the majority, I must say, saw the chance in political empowering by joining such politicians. As crazy as it may sound today, I was the witness. Some of the dissidents I was friends with were saying that Slobodna Milosevic was a hidden anti-communist. And, anti and they joined him. The social and the cultural decomposition of dissidents followed with a small group of pacifists and anti-nationalists incapable of forming a strong opposition to the nationalist group, majority, trying to guard the ruins of the age of reasons, which we, I think, which, which we did succeed. So what is the contribution of dissidents, educated, intelligent, and ambitious in the domain of nationalism? This was those other. Not much in genre clusters. The range of possible stories in origin were strictly, strictly limited to patriarchal patterns. Example, uh, the ancient identity myths, which are usually late, and which uh, massively were the product of the activity of the uh, uh, mythography, the mythographers, those who were writing the myths for a family, for a court, for a dynasty. Um, that was, let's say, uh, after the, the, the death of uh, Alexander the Great, uh, the division of the new world, the global world, 
in which the military, former military um, leaders uh, were having new possibilities as uh, the, the leaders of the kings, basically, of new countries, new smaller countries. And they would engage mythographs to write a mythological history of their uh, family, of their dynasty. So basically, the, this history is, is, is very simple. Uh, a god or a hero was passing through this region, and he raped a myth, or a girl, but usually a myth. And that's the beginning of the dynasty. So the family, thus the family, was claiming the origin from Heracles, from, from Zeus, or from other uh, well-known womanizing gods. Yeah, Dionysus and Apollo were rather low on the list of, uh, of a possible um, compass of such kind of rapes. <coughs> so the rape of a girl, of a nymph, would be at the beginning of the mythological story of the family. Well, that was not acceptable for modern nationalisms. So we do not have myths who were raped by heroes. We do have passing heroes pounding something on the way, but not the rape names. Uh, basically, we do not have women at all, which is related to another ancient uh, pattern of origin, myth of origin. And this is a very specific myth of origin. This is the Athenian myth of origin. And the Athenian myth of origin, which was largely debated by the late Nicole Lobo, a great French anthropologist of the ancient world, uh, the Athenians claimed that uh, they uh, come from a race of, of uh, dragons, whatever, uh, snakes, who are coming directly from the earth without uh, the body of the mother. And the term is described here very often and read very often autochthonous. The one who is heard of, uh, uh, born from the ground, from the dirt. <laughs> so this is autochthonous, without mother. So this motherless myth was very important uh, because it, it would uh, be used in modern nationalist discourse to avoid women. So basically there's no such thing as a nationalist heroine except in very, very rare cases in which uh, a heroine, a woman, appears as a helper of, of the, the patriarchal hero. <coughs> to explain this, I will give two randomly chosen uh, quotations, so we enter into this patriarchal or gender problematics, if you want. Um, this is a quotation from Predra Kualvestra, a member of the Serbian Academy of Arts and Sciences. So he says, he wrote, we have to raise the price of the Serbian blood, and that cannot be done without, uh, done in the graves. It, it's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's, it's not only uh, um, elliptic rhythm. The other, uh, which is much more explanatory, but goes into the same thing. Twice in the, it's a journalist, Milvoj Vizic, Twice in the 20th century, the Serbian substance was seriously, seriously endangered. From 1912 to 1945, in the Balkan and in the two world wars, more than 40 of 40% 40 of male population were exterminated. Such an ethnocide is not otherwise recorded in the world history, which is nonsense, of course. It's not 40%. And it's not recorded, and the world history is rather rich in such a side. But uh, the weakened Serbian being, being Serbian being, Serbian substance, could not, as a consequence, gain resistance against communism. So, so you see the historical explanation. Acknowledgments and adaptation meant survival, but this vitality resulted in the relativization of the traditional moral and all the pre-existing values, so moral and all the values are pre-existing. <coughs> so these two statements are commonplaces in contemporary Serbian national discourse. Invented by the elites, these images of the collective male body, basically it's a male body that is being constructed here, uh, transgresses from the cultural elites via the media back to the anthropological context of patriarchy where they originate from. They are both borrowed and reinvented, circulating among different social strata, 
and nurtured by oral tradition, modern image production, and high classes textual fixation, wiping out the structural differences between high and pop culture. The two taboos emerge clearly from these two statements, one, the grave, and the other, the creeping ideology. Both of these taboos can be ident identified with the feminine in the patriarchal society. Fear of miasma, that's uh, the immaculation uh, of things, of death, women handing dead bodies, ideology as a seductive force, but also a disease that weakens the collective male body. So basically, in this narrative, communism is feminine, which is extremely interesting. Both phenomena are well exemplified in the war situation of former Yugoslavia, where women's predominant pro-pacifist political orientation and certain political engagements, like women in black, use the taboo's potential, and in other post-socialist countries, as general resentment or resentment or revenge against women as supposedly the most fatal, fatal servants of communism. So the link goes further. The male substance, as Colomester points uh, to, unites patriarchal ritual semiotics and the imagery of an organic, scientific, enlightened, rationalist nationalism constructed the collective, collective, exclusively male body of history. The third, the least expected element in this imagined male body is weakness. Emerging from the images of Holovest and Lysch's reflection uttered in a secured fear surrounding, the weak male body is lacking blood and resistance to ideology as a disease. We could return to a certain need of weakness and femininity as structural parts of the construct of male citizen identity, as some anthropologists of the ancient world already noted. The perfect hero, for instance, Heraclitus, had to be feminine, had to be weak, has to be weak. And on the other hand, uh, if you analyze Paul Vestra's uh, uh, kind of poetic, uh, elliptic uh, statement, um, it does give a certain insight into the phenomenon of vampires. But I will not repeat it here. I will leave the vampires out. Uh, so, competitive Balkan collective identities were using both European and Oriental models in formulating their own use privy possidentis. That's the main thing. They come from the male body to the territory, to the uh, use privy possidentis. That's, of course, the you know, use privy possidentis is not a real use <coughs> in any uh, legal complex. It's a parody, uh, which means the, the right of the first to possess the territory, and this is usually um, in the domain of the wildest nationalist uh, imagination of how we came the first and became the first on certain soil. In a fragile balance, we speak about this new spring president, uh, in a very fragile balance with Greek aspirations in the same field which encompass basically not only all the Balkans, but also all of the Europe. And in fact, Europe was uh, kind of friendly to this myth uh, in the beginning of the 80s, when it accepted Greece without uh, basically any commitment, commitments uh, necessary for the rest of the states to the European Union. But that's, again, that opens another set of uh, uh, problems. Wisdom of the colonized is often a play at play when presenting our children, knowledge, or valor to a colonizer or a colonizer to be. The stereotype discursive stability of the Balkan politics as a prevailing model of historic interpretation of the 19th century in the region and also 20th should be replaced by a relational history culture discursive model which could, through the patterns of entanglement, I'm using here. Uh, a theory which is uh, rather new, less than 10 years old, uh, which uh, uh, sees the pro historical process as entanglement of narratives, of different narratives, and it's especially useful when it comes to states in conflict or to explain uh, pre war media, war media, and so on and so on. Despite a fine faction of negotiating inventions of identity, and the bright travel reveals reception of antiquity in it. 
I presented, and I want to present several cases of the reception of antiquity in the Balkans. I present at least three of them till now, <coughs> which reflect different facts of the concept of antiquity. Antiquity as a diasporic identification sign, as a cultural and epistemological interpretation of paradigm, and as a complicated set of tools for the imagining of the collective. The presence of antiquity is everywhere. All of these cases are more or less opposed or even generated to oppose the European concepts of antiquity when it comes to the Balkans. Thus, we have the creation of a useful term to underline the conflictual pattern of entanglement, revealing an enduring invention in the Balkans. The Balkan cultures and their political cultural initiatives aspire to liberate the region from the Turkish rule and to stabilize identities, national, mixed national, and federal, all but the Greek one, non-Greek ones have these aims, had to re-identify themselves against the European cultural mirror which reflected only the image of ancient Greeks. So the Greeks also had to re-identify re themselves, which was never a successful task, but at least more successful in pointing to the differences between the Greeks and the others, Balk, especially Balkan ethnic and cultural groups, especially Slavs. So this gradual colonization, which is still reflected in the European community definition of the two speed European countries, and now with the crisis, it's, it's blurred in an even uh, more uh, unrecognizable pattern. And uh, the geographically and historically absolutely inexplicable notion of the Western Balkans. I challenge you to give me the definition of the Western Balkans. Uh, has had seriously damaging political, cultural, and also economic consequences both in Greece in the 19th and 20th century and the bastard Balkan cultures. So the bastard Balkan cultures would be a huge, vast area of uh, exploration of nationalism, which is highly epistemologically ch challenging because it does superpose uh, different levels of recognition, of understanding, and of imagining the conflicting myths which care about each other in order to be authentic and believable. So uh, this, uh, this vastness of Balkan cultures <coughs> is one of the topics that I would really like to, uh, to promote, to underline as one of the most challenging, epistemologically challenging in studying uh, national discourses. Uh, now I go to, I'll go to another topic which is definitely linked with all this. Um, and you might have uh, felt the, the, the empty space which has to be filled. And this is the space of the author. I was speaking about intelligentsia, about the elites, about dissonance. But how do we deal with authors? Uh, and I don't mean the names. Uh, I mean the types of the, the, the characters of authors that, uh, defined by their poetics, not by their life. So if I wanted to, to define the authors and the opposers to the nationalist discourse by using the type of the author who uses a certain poetic points which can be defined. I, I must admit that I was able to find this only in the history of theolo uh, theological literature. And I found two types which can be applied and theorized in a quite satisfactory way. One is an apocalyptic writer. Uh, and the other is an exomologetic writer. Uh, apocalyptic author, you all know, uh, it's not only the apocalypse, but also it refers to all the theologic uh, authors, theologians, uh, who were revealing a certain truth, which is undeniable, so there's no debate about it. It's, it's a vision, it can be fantastic, it can be unbelievable, uh, incredible, but it is the truth revealed because apocalypse means revelation. So re re those who reveal the truth are apocalyptic authors. The other exomologetic box is a more touchy category. Exomology was appropriated by the Catholic uh, theology uh, and often used in its Greek form 
as an educative term for compassion. But if you go back to uh, the text of the Bible, you will find exomology of the Greek uh, word, the translation of Hebrew, in a quite a different uh, context. It does mean uh, approval of the promise. Approval of promise meaning giving arguments why do you believe that this or that. So, in fact, exomologists are philosophers who debate about what they want to uh, commit to. So, exomologetic would be basically a kind of opposer to uh, apocalyptic. So, an apocalyptic writer reveals the truth and he borrows his voice to a higher authority, people, God, even if he speaks in the first uh, as I. An exomologetic uh, admits himself, himself you know, ex has, that's who I am, admits his uh, basis, uh, his uh, ignorance, his <coughs> incapacity of understanding God on the moon. Why the apocalyptic remains with uh, realistic illusionism, I would say, which covers the realistic uh, discourses and fantastic discourses, and he's often near to nearing triviality, the exomologetic constructs transfiction, uh, the nuding or deconstructing literary strategies, and playing with reader, uh, mixing with voices, and so on and so on. So, in order to do to, the to lesson of confusion, I will name at least two authors which you might, might enjoy as apocalyptic and as exomologetic. Of course, the, the apocalypse, apocalypse uh, is the first text that you can use, but, it, but it's too obscure. It's obscure with interpreta by interpretation. But St. Augustine would be a very good example. And on the other side, a, a theologic author which is very rarely read and almost never cited, um, which is a pure exomologist with doubts, with mentioning of the truth, of the relativity of the truth in a theologian text, it's Pierre Abelard, who we all know uh, by his tragic love and uh, frustration, all these horrible stories and so on. But if you read his text, and they are translated into French, not only, they are not only they are Latin original, you will find out a thinker that is capable of debating the truth in Christian terms. So to ask himself, to ask the truth, to ask God about the truth, and so on and so on. And the answers are very often open. So if we uh, define apocalyptics as fundamentalists in philosophy, uh, their position is self-literacy very often and hypertextuality or communication with the immediate traditional uh, 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 predecessors. And exomologetic authors are closer to the learnings of uh, arbitrary. Uh, they are coming from the encyclopedic <coughs> education and interest and they are close to hypertextuality, not hyper, but hypertextuality, or communicating with non-traditional and sometimes forgotten or um, expressively old or even banned texts. So in the field of formal logic, the apocalyptics usually use analogies, and exomologists by definition use syllogisms. Syllogisms. And when it comes to, when it comes to doxa, to religion, basically, apocalyptics uh, are orthodox in the larger sense of the word, in the real sense of the word, so right believers, just believers, and uh, exomologists are basically heterodoxons, if I may invent the term. They have different doxa to use. Semantically, apocalyptic group uh, is more into connotation and exomologetic into denotation. And so, if we come further and, and start to ask a uh, question of life, what is their position of life, then in the position of exomologetics, we would find 
something that is culturally known as barbarism, and in the position of apocalyptic writers, dandyism. So these are the forgotten terms. The finding things from literature happening in the 19th century, but that's exactly why I wanted them to, to, to be used to, to, to reveal the possibilities of, of reading the past in a new way. <coughs> Basically, the concept of writing of an apocalyptic author um, is uh, uh, close to epigraph, uh, an eternal letter, eternal writing, and an exomologetic author uh, uses uh, perishable forms of writing. In the inventory of cultural symbols, an apocalyptic writer uh, likes archetypes, and an exomologetic writer likes avatars. And in their uh, uh, writing practices, practices, apocalyptic writer like aphorisms, short um, statements, and uh, uh, exomologetic writers like ontologies, encyclopedia, and diatribes as forms, which always open the space of knowledge and not close. On the plan of rhetoric, an exomologetic writer would rather use the complicated forms of the seduction in the text. The seduction theory of seduction was popular in the 80s of the last century. And, uh, unfortunately, it was very soon forgotten. It was extremely useful to explain the writing and the ecriture problem in, in feminism. <coughs> An apocalyptic writer uh, used uh, more simple procedures, like, uh, for instance, just turning the communist harang into an anti-communist harang, which is extremely easy. <laughs> There's no problem at all. Or the communist text into religious text. So we've, we've seen that. Just a slight change in terms, just in slight changing in a simple way, names, you get what you want. When we come to stylistic figures of Tokoi, and I think this is the, the most uh, uh, productive area for stereotypes, an apocalyptic uh, author would use amplification in the terms of ancient rhetorics, and uh, the exomologetic uh, author would uh, use a double sense. And, uh, we come now to the rhetoric of avant-garde movements. <coughs> One of the key figures in Surah's writing, which also appears in Dada and in Futurist text, is Boudinage. This is a, a, a kind of visual uh, translation of the old term of amplification, and that is the uncontrolled magnification of meaning by gluing different semantic uh, inventions and so on, on the way. So it goes very fast and it goes bigger and bigger. Uh, interestingly enough, it can be illustrated better in visual terms than in text. And basically, I was thinking of Bourdonnais effect uh, when last night uh, wandering to Skopje and looking for our hotel. We had to pass through the center some seven times, <laughs> and each time I had the more precise impression that this is the golden age effect of monuments which uh, uh, accumulate, accumulate in such an extent that at the end you are not able to, to, to etiquette the meanings, that the meanings are completely blurred. So the effect golden age, let me remind you, uh, was used by surrealists uh, to pinpoint the non-conscious, the subconscious effect, uh, which may be expressed in, in uh, the belief of uh, surrealists in the text. We know very well that it cannot be transferred into the text, but they believe it could. So this kind of amplification <coughs> would the next effect uh, believed by surrealists to be effective, to be possible, can be perhaps today connected to a new trend in our, uh, anthropology, which I recently met, and this is the, the study of uh, the neocortical meaning of security, <laughs> which means that the anthropologists are studying the possibility of the effect uh, of the constant state of siege, which is produced by nationalist discourse, or the golden age effect, which goes from day to day, 
uh, increasing all the time about the security and about the position of the collective, which is reduced to one scared individual. So this effect on, on, on people who are, who are highly and unnaturally concerned about their own security in the collective, only in the collective, by the golden age effect, can be connected <laughs> directly to this accumulation of things that, that uh, one can see around uh, oneself. This is just, just a kind of framework to think about, because I, I, I noticed that yesterday, <laughs> but it's, it serves the, the purpose that I have here. So, one uh, amplification of golden edge is basically an apocalyptic uh, procedure. Uh, Exomologists uh, uh, use uh, calambos, which is a French term for fun, uh, and uh, the metasemic weapon of the exomologetic way of writing are anagrams and acrostyles, or acrostyle uh, speaking. And the apocalyptic remain with words which change meaning <laughs> in forms. forms. Now we come to the mistakes, <coughs> which are extremely interesting because they are part of the statistics, because they are under, uh, undetected. So apocalyptic writing would use catacrisis, and this is the use of the words which do not have their objects anymore. Uh, and thus they produce the fogging of the meaning or the stereotypes that do not have meaning at all, but they function in the language. Let me, let me just say a few of them, and you will understand what I'm thinking about. Cradle. Who uses the cradle today? Fireplace, or hub, only in fashionable rich homes. Uh, the threshold. Where's the threshold in a modern house? It doesn't exist at all. It's, it's a concept. So, uh, the use of things that do not exist anymore, the use of words which design the things that denote the things that do not exist anymore, is extremely important. Because not only uh, it's a catacrisis, it's a mistake, but it also denotes a possible life context which is not real at all. So we, we do basically we do use words in which we do not live. So this is the forming of the keywords that are based on stereotypes, and uh, one of these words which, which turned into stereotypes and lost basically all of its meaning is spirituality. Because it was familiarized in different contexts, nationalist, new age, and so on and so on. Uh, and it, as such, it can be taken as a keyword in uh, approving the violence. Exomologetics. Uh, stay with the privileged use of amphiguris and nonsense. <laughs> These are uh, the, the ancient uh, writers, the rhetoric authors, knew about the nonsense. They, they call it amphiguri, and uh, the nonsense, which is the British term. Uh, and uh, more of this uh, extra textual science uh, to, uh, to make the, the things look deconstructed and silly. Of course, we live through that, that uh, an, uh, an exomologetic writer becomes an apocalyptic writer. But this is a very sad story. <laughs> I won't go into